It's been said, perhaps by Gladstone, that there's no finer road in Britain than that between Barmouth and Dolgethlai. Unless, that is, you count the road between Dolgethlai and Barmouth. But let's not argue about it. The glorious estuary of the Malbach lies ahead. Let's see how the day unfolds and what surprises lie in store. It only takes a few seconds. The bucket and spade seaside hubbub of Barmouth falls behind you and you're in a peaceful world with your thoughts for company. And then you round the corner and there's this surprising late Victorian terrace. It looks stranded. It's a beginning without an end. Solomon Andrews was the brains behind it, a developer who thought that on this sublime stretch of the estuary, he would build a fine resort. Solomon Andrews was certainly a remarkable man. He made his money in uh, Cardiff, trams and uh, various other uh, enterprises. And then, uh, for some reason, he came up to uh, North Wales and began to develop at Pusheli. And then he came here. He also bought land in Abu Dhabi, but that uh, didn't come to much. But uh, in Pusheli, he developed quite a bit. And here, three terraces, including this one, uh, were built. He had big ideas here. He wanted to develop a marina. He wanted to develop tramways here. But uh, on the whole, it wasn't a very successful project. What happened in the end? Did he run out of money? I think really he ran out of time. Uh, he died, I believe, in 1908. A valiant attempt. Had Solomon Andrews lived, there would be a promenade here, and the place would be ruled by seaside landladies. The path takes me down towards the pretty village of Arthog, with its evocative grey stones, waiting for artists. There's a bizarre story about this village. It was the home of Mary Thomas, the famous fasting woman of Wales, a living skeleton who drew streams of visitors, including at one time the Duke of Gloucester. Mary fell ill when she was a little girl and took to her bed and stayed there for the best part of 80 years, living on little but bread and water. Now, Edward Pugh, who visited her in 1815, said in his book that although she starved by day, some said that she had a voluptuous appetite by night. But he also said, more compassionately, I think, would a young, beautiful girl really adopt such a rigid way of life? A strange thing, especially when the lovely landscape of the Arthog Valley lay at her door, something to give thanks for. In the early years of tourism, people used to marvel at waterfalls like this and would pay to see them. We're a bit blasé about them now, though I have to say that I find them hypnotic. Water is energy too, and this stream was one of the first in Wales to be made to drive a dynamo to produce electricity. The waters are channeled to a turbine house, and it's still in use after 70 years. The designer was Richard Edwards, a wheelwright, a self-educated pioneer of the electrical age, and many think he deserves greater recognition. By 1909, the local parish council in Van Hilton approached him, asking him for a plan, a scheme, to light the streets with oil lamps. Richard, however, put forward an alternative scheme whereby he would use the water wheel at the mill to drive a dynamo to provide electric lighting. And when he was asked for his price for this scheme, the local council was astounded to find that it was cheaper than actually employing a man to look after the oil lamps. And by 1910, the streets of Tanuflin were lit by electricity, as I understand the earliest scheme of its type in Wales. What were the towns and villages that uh, Richard Edwards electrified? Apart from Llanilchwyl itself, there was Hwynguril, Llanbachret, Bangum, Maybod, Trergol, Abertabeni, Corris, uh, Putglas and Penmachan.
The power is for the private use of this magisterial Victorian residence, Tinacoid, a jewel of a place which has been the setting of several films. People really built houses in those days, and just to live here, well, you'd feel a foot taller. The electricity is free. There's no need to turn switches off to economize. In each fireplace, I have an electric fire. And uh, in most cases, they're allowed to run throughout the winter. So we actually generate, obviously, heating for ourselves. Um, we cook by our own electricity. Um, we have a fridge, we have a deep freeze, and of course, uh, television. And effectively, we are totally sustained by our own power. So, where's the catch? Well, the falling leaves of autumn would choke the grills protecting the water inlets, and they have to be raked out. During a hard time, I might even have to set my alarm clock and get out of bed as frequently as every two hours. But fortunately, that doesn't normally go on for too long. And then uh, after that, the, the room might be in spate and the leaves clear for a little time, but they come back again. So between the end of October and maybe some years, the end of January, beginning of February, it can be a bit tough. So, if you're out one moonlit night and see a man in his pyjamas raking a river, take no notice. Up here you tread in ancient footprints. The bridge leads to the vestigial remains of a great house, Llys Bradwen, home of a mountain ruler. It stood here, in this commanding place beneath Cadda Idris, more than a thousand years ago. The Yellowhammer heard from his ancestors that crumbs always fell from the banqueting table. A stone circle stands witness. Imagine priests and worshippers, ritual, belief, fearfulness, everything focused on this enigmatic central stone. I wonder, did those people who lived and worshipped up here long ago feel the same exhilaration that I feel at the spectacle of the white beaches of the Malvach and the wild mountains of the Rhinog Range? You think of all those feet that have pounded this path and worn it down. This valley was a highway for drovers, the old Welsh cowboys, and their herds of long-horned cattle. The landscape puts me in mind of the rugged mountains of the American West, so that I half expect to see smoke signals and Indians silhouetted on the ridge. It seems to be the only house in the whole heavenly valley. There's no road to it, no electricity. Gwynvor Evans, the elder statesman of Plaid Cymru, stayed here often, and you can see why a love for Wales would be nurtured in this place. I walk with the tumbling stream, past the stones which tell the story of a more recent past, the fallen stones of abandoned farms, and a ruined chapel, demolished not by time, but by a local woman who didn't want it to become a holiday home, and so she bought it. She pulled the roof off and let it decay, an act of respect to those who worshipped and lie buried here. Two stones to an architect and his wife, graceful, humble, and dignified. O oh Lord, give your blessing to the strivings of your architects, your representatives seeking to create your heaven 
in our country. The resonant land speaks most eloquently for itself, and all that's required of me is to listen. This house is resolutely unchanging. The panelled hall running right through it, just as it was more than 500 years ago. On the right, near the farmhouse, is a chapel, almost concealed by the trees. Its congregation dwindled down and it closed. And today, Winifred Rees, who worshipped here for half a century, returns for the first time since the door was locked three years ago. I played the organ for 50 years, I think. Did you? Yes. So you've known this place since what? Since yeah. you were a little girl? Well, I was christened here in 1918. What do you remember of it when you were a child? Well, the, all the seats were you know, occupied then. And when did you last see the chapel filled with people? We had to wait in here. Uh, um, 20 years ago, and there was 100 guests in the other end. 100? Which was full, yeah. That's a happy memory. It was. <laughs> there was only six of us in the end. Um, so we couldn't keep it you know, open. What will happen um, to it? Well, we don't know. I'm afraid it's gone forever now, mm. afraid. It joins the witnesses, like the ancient stones. It's said that the last wolf in Britain was hunted to death more than 250 years ago. But there's a story that a wolf was chased up there on that farm, Kevin or Owen, at a much later date. Two brothers pursued a she-wolf, and as she disappeared into her lair, one of them grabbed her by the tail, and the other came up and killed her and her cubs. As I say, it's just a story, but I do wonder if she was the last wolf in Wales. This awesome cliff on Cader Idris has its place in mountaineering history. It was first scaled in 1888 by Owen Glyn Jones, the inventor of rock climbing as a science. He was an incredibly strong man. He could hang from a beam by just three fingers of his left hand, and he could lift a man from the floor with his right hand. He adored Cader Idris. He came here time after time. But sadly, he was killed in a climbing accident in the Alps, and he lies buried in Switzerland. There's a haunting mewing sound in Wales that for me speaks of wild places. <coughs> the buzzard, his chum, the eagle owl, is not amused. No. No. They're both fairly tame, I encountered them at the Guernan Lake Hotel, which is also a refuge for homeless ferrets. I call myself now Wales Ferret Welfare. Um, and this is what I do, is not only take in strays, but answer any questions that people have about ferrets, because there's still an awful lot of ignorance about them. It's believed that the ferret was introduced by the Romans, and it, at that time, it was already domesticated. Um, it was used for hunting. How many ferrets do you have here? Um, at the moment, 14, although some of those are due to go off to new homes. I don't keep any one ferret for great periods of time. How do they reach you? Normally from the RSPCA or from people who don't want them anymore. They do make very good pets. Um, anything that moves tends to disappear and get hidden in, in strange corners. They all have their their own characters 
each will have different eating habits, different sleeping habits, and will normally get into places you don't want it to be in. If you show it affection and love and kindness, it will respond in like manner. They're rather charming creatures, aren't they? I think they'd be very loyal. I feel I've learnt something to ponder on as I march on into the afternoon. On the ridge above is a house far better known in America than it is in Wales. Bryn Mawr is the most distinguished women's college in the United States. And this house was the home of Roland Ellis, a Quaker, who fled persecution in Wales in the 17th century. In Pennsylvania, he built himself a copy of his Welsh home. It became the nucleus of the pioneering institution in women's education. The house was recently restored but the owner's wife died less than a year after the marriage, and she's buried in the garden, which looks out over Dolgechlai and the mountains. The Aran River, a witness to murder. In 1877, the dismembered body of a young woman Sarah Hughes was found here, and a respectable married man, Cadwallader Jones, confessed to the killing. He was sentenced to death. But Cadwallader was so popular that no carpenter in Dolgethlai would build his gallows, and so they had to send for one from Chester. And Cadwallader was the last man to hang in Dolgethlai jail. Down this path, there's a house which was owned by Baron Richards in the early 19th century. His remarkable granddaughter, Marianne, married a bandit known as the Spanish Tiger. Well, Marianne was very keen on hunting. She was a hard-riding girl, and not really one's image of a Victorian lady at all. So it was not surprising that she married the Spanish Tiger. I think it was just as well she was an orphan when she married him, because I can't feel that her parents would have approved at all, even though she was 29 years old at the time when she married him. And he got his name, the Spanish Tiger, because he was a really ferocious guerrilla fighter in the Carlist Wars, who was supposed to have shot hundreds of prisoners in cold blood. Though there is some excuse for him, because his mother was executed by the Royalists, by firing squad. Do you think she tamed him? She was extremely strong-willed, because after his death, she refused to see any of the elder children, because they'd been brought up as Catholic, which she'd agreed to and left all her money to the youngest, the Protestant daughter. And she filled the grounds with detectives and policemen whose sole job was to throw out her children if they came to call. And that lasted until her death in 1915. Old-fashioned family values. In the patch of tawny grass at Tithin Carrig is a burial ground where many Quakers, persecuted and tortured, were laid to rest. In 1660, a mob burst into a meeting of Quakers here and pulled 14 of them out, tied them to hurdles, and dragged them off to jail. They appeared before a court in Bala, and Judge Walcott was the judge, and he had a desire to hang the men, hang and quarter them, and uh, also to burn the women. And we, we can understand, in a way, because that enmity still was uh, after the, the Civil War that happened just a decade before, only a decade. Uh, so we can understand why the Quakers suffered, not because of their religion, in a way, but their political views was so close behind. What happened to the Quakers in the end? Well, um, we know that many emigrated to America, and in, in fact, the cream of the area, those uh, small estate owners, they emigrated, which was a great loss to the community. On the hill above lies a stretch of common grazing ground for farmers whose rights to it are 380 years old. 
The rules allow 151 cattle to graze here for two separate periods of five weeks. The only people that use it now are two or three of us because the farms have disappeared more or less with amalgamation and the rural depopulation. Things have changed, but we keep to the rules. Is, is it uh, important to keep to the rules uh, for reasons of conservation, for land reasons, or is it just tradition? Well, tradition and for the benefit of the cattle as well. There's no point in turning too many here. Tommy Price wrote a fine verse in strict meter, a son's loving homage to his mother's memory, and it's carved on her gravestone. So alive in my mind, despite the grave, whilst I am, you shall be. There's nothing complete for me in this world without you. The poet is a miner digging for chiming syllables and flowing melody. And England should be as simple as possible within the, the strict meter, which is very difficult, really. It's uh, quite easy to get words together, but to get them as simple as possible, it isn't so easy. When did you learn the, the art of the strict meter writing? I learned them very young, when I was when I was about 14, I think, when I was in school, and uh, trying to make an England here and there quite silly ones, really. But that's the way you practice doing anything, isn't it? Have you written them all your life? No one again, no one again. The final punctuation of my walk is the surprising church at Brithdir. Its features make it much more an Italian church than a Welsh one. Inside especially, you might think yourself in a church in Tuscany. My grandmother, who married a second time, a gentleman by the name of Reverend Charles Tooth, was responsible for the organization of building this church because uh, Charles Truth was the, had been the rector and founder of St. Mark's Church in Florence, Anglican Church. My grandmother was keen that it should be, bear a likeness to where he had spent a lifetime uh, as a, uh, a parson. This is why we have these rather fascinating Italian colouring. It's also, of course, very well known for its beautiful beaten copper, both on the pulpit and on the altar. Indeed, it's the only church in Britain with such remarkable copper work. Give free rein to your imagination and you can hear the sounds of battle. Constance Farrow was the aunt of Field Marshal Montgomery and she lived in Brithdie during the Second World War. And nearby too lived the maiden aunts of Lord Cunningham, the Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Fleet. And so while their nephews were fighting it out on land and sea, these ladies were refighting things here in Bristia. And as I understand it, they didn't always see eye to eye, and so it was often war over the teacups. Well, in Wales, there's a story with every step. I've enjoyed my walks, and I hope you have too. <laughs>